Wait, you get out? You're muted. <laughs> okay, see, I wanted some of the glitches to be on my end for once. How about my share, taking one for the team with technology issues. I love you, yeah. And if I don't have any, I'll just create my own. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Here we are. Solidarity means so much to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome Hello. to Learning in Space. Uh, my name is Nicole Gallucci and I am with my co-host here, Georgia Bracey. Hi there. At the office because her computer works. <laughs> yeah, I know. We are far from each other, sort of, today. Through the wall. Um, I have had problems with three different machines today. So <laughs> uh, as you can see, I'm in my, my home office. Um, so hopefully the, the uh, internet has been fixed here and, and we will get go through a smooth uh, broadcast. Apologies for the late notice, everybody. I thought I had put up this event page days ago and apparently I had completely forgotten. Uh, I was I was sick a couple days last week, so that's kind of thrown everything off. So thank you guys for being here. And if you missed it, I apologize and thank you for watching on the reruns. Right. Um, so we had to uh, change again because I, I I I messed up and didn't confirm with our guest in time. We did have to switch topics around with what we were going to talk about next week. Uh, we're going to try and get Sarah Mitchell back on to talk about uh, family science at NASA. So this week you get a topic that we've been trying to do. <laughs> Um, all about earth caching. So this is a um, a a sort of a I don't know. It's not quite citizen science, but it's it's definitely citizen engagement. <laughs> yeah, right. It's definitely it's informal science, which I can talk a little bit about. Um, so yeah, there's some overlap with citizen science, which is kind of interesting, but it is different. It's not um, you're not doing science. But you are engaged in science activity, science-related activity, and hopefully science learning. So, so there's some overlap. Yeah. So George is going to tell us a little bit about what Earth caching is. Uh, neither of us are terribly experienced at it, but you are working on a project that is researching um, Earth caching and Earth cachers. Um, so I don't know if you want to start by explaining what Earth caching is, and maybe start with geocaching because people might be more familiar with that term. Yeah, exactly. So geocaching has been around um, for much longer than earth caching, and earth caching kind of comes from, comes out of geocaching. So yeah, that's a good place to start, and there is a nice website for it, geocaching.com. If you aren't familiar and you want to learn more about it, that's the place to go. Uh, geocaching is sort of a, it's a treasure hunt using GPS technology and getting people outside to actually navigate their way to a site where somebody has chosen that site for it could be a lot of different reasons. Maybe it's just it's got some um, historical interest, um, architectural, landforms, so many different things. Uh, maybe it's just a beautiful site along a trail and somebody um, wanted to get other people to navigate their way and find this particular site. And so to mark the site, there's usually a small box of some sort, and inside the box is um, sometimes a logbook, sometimes just little toys or trinkets. Um, a lot of times there's coins, um, it's kind of like a commemorative coin of some sort. A lot of people make their own, and, and so it becomes something that they kind of collect and trade. So some people will leave one of their own coins in the box and take another one. And then there's sort of an additional logging component. If you want, you can go online, talk about where you've been and what you've found. And, and people through the logbooks can track uh, who's visited to the site. Sometimes they try to track um, even these coins and see you know, where these coins have made their way around the world from people, you know, passing them on through these boxes, through these caches. So geocaching is really, it's really a treasure hunt. Gets you outside, gets you to some interesting places, and of course the fun of just trying to navigate your way using GPS and, and finding your way to the right spot. So that's uh, geocaching, and that's been around for a while. I'm not even sure how long. Um, and I don't know how many people are participating in that, but I know it's a lot because, as Nicole mentioned, earth caching kind of came out of geocaching. And there's a lot of similarity, but earth caching has more of a, 
um, intentional science learning component to it. So it's definitely a learning activity. So people thought, you know, geocaching is great. It gets people outside, gets people engaged, but and certainly you probably learn some stuff when you're geocaching. But they wanted to create activities that were like geocaching, but had particular learning goals. So there was something that the person who developed the Earth Cache wanted you to learn about science, wanted you to experience. So that sort of uh, puts a different slant on the activity. But the other things are very much the same in that you still, there's still a particular set of coordinates that you use your GPS to find. And you still go outside and you find your way there. But once you're there, there's some questions and some activities that you need to do in order to complete the Earth Cache. So one kind of evolved out of the other. <laughs> but they're very much similar. Um, my first run-in with geocaching was in uh, 2004. Yes, 2004. So have, then, you, have you geocached? So no, I, I did not. But I, ha oh, I was. Okay. I was yeah, I didn't have a GPS. We didn't have smartphones then. Um, <laughs> we, I was a tour guide at the Very Large Array. Um, so I was a summer, well, I was a summer student in Socorro, New Mexico, working at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And every summer student is expected to give tours at least like two days during the summer, which is fantastic. I loved it. Um, and I had these people come to me with this worksheet, and they're like, "We're looking for this box." With the, they had their GPSs. I'm like, "What? Is, what are you doing?" They're like, "It's called geocache." They explained it to me. I'm like, "That's the coolest thing ever." <laughs> Part of the geocache, they had to answer some questions based on the displays in the visitor center. And the visitor center had changed since the geocache had been oh, yeah. I'm having trouble. So I go to the woman who's running the gift shop, and she goes, oh, I know what you're talking about. She pulls out this sheet, and they had all the old answers from the old displays. Oh, that's funny. She was still coming out there with that worksheet, and so we were able to help them out. And I think they, they found the box. I, I don't remember what was in it, but... Uh, that was my first run-in with geocaching. So when I heard about earth caching taking on the, the scientific spin, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I had never heard of either one before I got involved in this study. And but it's funny, just um, just to, well, earlier this summer, my husband and I were out hiking um, at a state park in Kentucky, and we just happened to see something off the trail, and we thought it was you know, okay, some plastic garbage box, you know, somebody had, somebody had littered and that's bad and we're going to go pick that up and take it, you know, out with us and, and throw it away and turns out it's a geocache box and so we just happened to find, because, you know, they're it's likely to find those kinds of things where people are walking and hiking, so we <laughs> couldn't believe though that we just sort of accidentally find it and uh, it had some cute little things in it and the little log book and all that so we thought that was that was pretty cool so it may not be trash that you see somewhere off in the woods or on the side of the trail it could be a geocache box so you have to investigate that um, but earth caching has yeah particular learning goals and earth caching has been around for about 10 years in fact they just celebrated their 10 year anniversary I don't know the date but this year and um, lots of people, millions of people are participating in earth caching around the world and of course geocaching is worldwide too well, it's but because the ubiquity of, of uh, smartphones do you think? Um, it could be um, because certain, there's there's apps you can get for earth caching and geocaching which help you find you know if you're in a particular location and you just want to know hey are there any earth caches where I am right now I'm, you know on vacation and I have some time and if there's some close by I can do one so there's apps that will let you find nearby earth caches um, beyond that I don't know what else the apps let you do um, because I haven't been really an active participant, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, in earth caching or geocaching. But, um, but yeah, there's lots of things you know that the smartphones, right, can let you do um, access maps, coordinates, all that, and of course GPS that you know weren't around years and years ago. So you know that's a great development and helps people out a lot. So, but um, so earth cache, yeah, is is really. Tiny Intern, uh, you guys know her as Tiny Intern, yeah. if you follow us on Twitter. Yes. But, um, Odom, um, when we went, we went on a little trip to the, the watershed, nature, watershed Nature Center. Yeah. 
and she pulled out her app. She had a geocaching app, <laughs> and was I think looking for a, a, a box um, while on site while we were there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I know it's really it's it's a lot of fun. Yes. So I have done one Earth Cache <laughs> with okay. our STEM Center group here, and it was great. And it's something you know. Of course, if you love the outdoors, you're going to love Earth Caches because um, Earth caching tries to get you to learn something about the earth, um, the processes going on in the earth, um, some of the history, how formations got to be the way they are. So it's all good earth science, geoscience learning that's going on with earth caches. So in addition to having a wonderful outdoor experience and navigating, you know, finding the site itself, then you get there and you can learn something interesting about the earth. And help you appreciate the beauty of your surroundings all the more. And if you want to find out about the earth caches versus geocaching, um, go to earthcache.org. And on that site, because I see there is a question from Tatiana. Yeah, about location. About location, yep. Yeah. So it, they are definitely worldwide. And if you go to earthcache.org, and then I believe on the top menu, I just was looking at this, um, there's a place where it says EC list, so you can get the list of all the earth caches that are out there. And if you go to advanced search, you can filter that list by country. Um, and if you want to keep going, I believe, for example, United States, you can filter it by state. Um, so there's filtering features there, and you can find things that are near you. And then once you find some that are near you, you can further filter by types of earth caches. So particular landforms that you're interested in, if you want to find some that like have to do with caves, or you want to learn more about the prairie, or you want to, um, if you're really lucky, find out more about volcanoes, <laughs> something really exciting. Um, those features and filters are all there, so it's very helpful um, when you want to find a particular one or find one that's near you. So the earthcache.org site. There's the art list. 47 of them. So, and there are, there's tons of them. And you've got, oh great, so in Ireland, excellent. Okay. All kinds. Record 1 through 20 of 47. Okay, so three pages of results in Ireland. So that's fantastic. So yes, yeah, so it's definitely a worldwide, it's a worldwide phenomenon and growing and growing all the time. And because of that, we decided we wanted to study this thing that's huge and getting huger, but really nobody has studied earth cachers or earth caching uh, before. So that added a little more excitement to it because it's really a new area of study. And as Nicole mentioned, you know, there's some overlap with citizen science. There's some aspects of it. It might be the same, certainly the potential for science learning, for being engaged in uh, a science-related activity, for doing this on your own time, which is the big sort of similarity. It's informal science, so that means it's not necessarily happening in a formal classroom. Um, you, you choose to do it. It's a free choice activity. And if you don't like it, you can stop. <laughs> so the question is, you know, why do people do it? And why are so many people doing it? What's so engaging about it? Why do people keep doing it? So those are some of the questions we were thinking about as we designed our study. And it's very similar questions to what you know, CosmoQuest and other citizen science groups are studying about their participants because they're volunteer. Um, you have some that participate a little bit and then some that keep coming back and do a lot. And so you want to know, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you volunteering? And um, what are you learning from it? Are you learning more content? Are you learning more about how science works? Um, those are more citizen science of the questions. But for us, we wanted to know um, the learning piece. You know, what do earth cachers at least think that they're learning? Um, and why do they keep participating? So what is it about this activity that keeps people doing it? Um, and then we also just asked them to describe their experience earth caching because we wanted to know more about the experience itself. Um, what makes it easy? Uh, what makes it difficult? Are there any barriers to participating? 
would they do it more if maybe it was a little different? So some of it was just basic gathering information about the experience itself because it hasn't been widely studied. So what we did that Earth Cache at the Watershed Center, and it was a—I mean, it was all flat. It was a very easy little walk. Yeah. Um, and for me, it felt kind of like a self-guided tour. Yeah. Like you show up, you don't have tour guides or anything, and they don't and you're out in the wild. You don't necessarily have signs telling you what you're looking at, but you take this piece of paper with you or an app, whatever you have, um, and you're answering questions and looking at it and going through, and uh, that is. Um, Kind of like giving yourself a tour. Do you know where is there like a spectrum of difficulty of these activities? Where 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 that one maybe was that like an easy one? Yes, and that I believe that's also a way you can filter on the site you were showing before. So um, they are rated, and I'm not sure exactly if that's whoever develops it sort of gives it the rating themselves. I don't know if other people. Um, rate them. I'm not quite sure how that works, but they are categorized um, according to difficulty because some definitely are very difficult and involve some, you know, rock climbing and you know, scaling heights and you know, they're very challenging. And then some are like the watershed one where we went to, where you're just kind of leisurely strolling alongside a pond, and it's. That's great because then you know you know you can bring kids. It's safe. You don't need any special equipment. Um, you don't have to be particularly fit to do it either. You know it's it's accessible to everyone. <laughs> so there's definitely a range, yeah, of difficulty and challenges for the Earth Cache. It's just wide open. So which is great. So there's something for everybody in a sense. Um, and then you mentioned too, it is. It's like a self-guided tour. Um, you need some information ahead of time, and that's. Uh, something you get on the website through Earth, uh, earthcache.org. So when you pick the particular earthcache you want to do, um, there'll be instructions. Sometimes there's questions. Sometimes it does help to print things out ahead of time. A lot of people say that's helpful. I imagine that's something that the um, smartphones help with because if you're out there and you need more information or you forgot the directions or forgot the questions and you're on the site, you can just access if you can with your phone and you can just find find that again. But a lot of people just will print out whatever they need and then they'll head out and find the site. So and then after you visited the Earth Cache, there's sort of um, more things you need to do. You need to go back to the site and you need to log uh, your experience. Usually you have to answer the questions and most often just email them to whoever developed that Earth Cache. So they kind of they kind of check your answers and you don't always get feedback, but sometimes you do. Um, and then you'll sort of be officially uh, complete and you've actually done that Earth Cache. So it's that whole process of you have to go, you have to do that sort of afterward activity. You have to log your information, you have to send your answers in, whatever it required you to do, and then whoever is developing um, or in charge of that Earth Cache will sort of, you know, officially mark you as you've completed it. So it's going through the whole process that actually makes you able to say, yep, I did the Earth Cache. So, um, so you guys went to a conference for Earth Caching recently. Is this the one in Vancouver? Yes. Yes, this okay. is actually, yeah, the second one we did. The first one was about a year ago, and that was in St. George, Utah. Um, and it's they call them these these mega events, Earth Cache mega events, and it's just a big gathering of um, all Earth Cachers, whoever can come. And they do have some speakers. It's not quite like an academic conference. It's more like um, a gathering of amateur astronomers, actually, or any kind of hobbyists. Um, but they do have um, great speakers and people. Earth Cache. Um, there's social events, all that kind of thing you would expect. So the first one we went to about a year ago was when we started to collect our information. So we wanted to first find really experienced earth cachers who um, could give us all the information we needed to know about earth caching. And so we interviewed 12 people at the conference um, or the event that was a year ago. Um, asking them you know, what they liked, what they didn't like, how many earth caches have they done, how did they find out about it, just trying to gather all sort of that baseline information 
um, and these were really experienced earth cachers. So they, they had a lot to say, and it was really great. We learned a whole lot about earth caching just from these first 12 interviewees. And then the next step was to take those responses um, and create a big survey. So we did this huge survey on Qualtrics on the internet, um, which you could access through the Earth Cache site. And this survey just reached a, a big audience. We had to limit it to the United States, unfortunately, um, for a couple of reasons. But um, we have plans for the future to make it even bigger. Um, but this first survey um, asked some similar questions because we were still trying to find, you know, motivational types of information. You know, why are you doing it? What are you learning? Um, who do you earth cache with? What's your experience like? So it was still exploring this earth cache experience and what people learn and why they do it. But now this was just on a, on a larger scale. So a big online survey. We had about um, 441 yes people respond, um, and you know which was great. And all from the United States. Um, we had to also limit it to people at least 18 years old. So one thing, again, maybe for the future we're thinking of, yes, is, you know, we don't, we didn't get a lot of information about um, the kid experience with earth caching. We did a little bit through the adults, but we weren't able to talk directly to anyone younger than 18. So um, that's something we want to kind of emphasize a little more and figure out good ways to do that in the future. But, but this was a good start, so we got... Um, a lot of responses from United States adults earth caching to try to see um, what was going on out there with it. And I can bring up, so I can share a couple of the things we found out from that study. Uh, I wanted to interject. And sure, yeah. Glad, um, I, I vaguely heard of this, but I don't know much about it. This is back to the, the geocaching we're talking about. If you've ever heard of Ingress, it's a game by the Google sub company that's based on geocaching, only with a lot more locations of portals. And it's um, more of a control game than a treasure hunt. And I don't, I don't know much about it, but um, I guess if you, if you have played Ingress or know more about it, you guys can comment and, and chat with me about that. I, yeah, I, unfortunately, I have not uh, seen that. Or actually, I've, I've heard of it, but I've never actually played it. I've so. never heard of that either, but that sounds cool. Yeah, excellent. Okay, let me see if I can if I can screen share. <laughs> Always the big if. Screen share, fun. I know. Here we go. Another pinwheel of doom. All right, share. Yay! Sharing. Okay, it looks like it's sharing. Okay, so some basic results from this is from the big survey that we did, Sorry. and. As you can see, um, we have a largely male population um, who are Caucasians <laughs> and somewhat, I guess you could say, middle-aged, um, doing the large part of the earth caching. Um, so, you know, 65% male, 91% um, Caucasian, um, and then about a little over half, about 54 percent, um, were in the age range of 45 to 64. So, um, and that probably sounds familiar to um, citizen science people. Um, that's there's a lot of overlap there. The CosmoQuest study, but the age and gender. Actually, your gender is even more equitable than the one we. <laughs> a little bit, because yeah, this is this involves technology. So there's a technology aspect to it that might be at work here. Um, uh, but you know, we really don't we really don't know, um, and it's a it's a lot of stuff we still have to follow up on. You know, we we're still analyzing data, and so we're not even really at the point of drawing any major conclusions here yet, so there's still a lot to think about. But this is the data that we got, so it's it's a beginning. So we know that, um, you know, this is kind of the population that's out there, at least from this survey. Um, and of course, this survey was online, which, you know, creates some bias there. Um, so there's other places that we maybe need to look to get a little more information. Um, let me show you just a couple other things. 
So looking at education and um, finances here, we've got um, a large chunk of the earth cashers having at least a bachelor's um, or higher. So 34% had a bachelor's degree. Um, and then household income from our bins, we looked at um, 70,000 to 99,000. Um, and that was our largest group, and that came in at just about 25% there. So, um, again, you know, some fairly, you know, fairly well off uh, kind of group, um, educated, fairly well educated. Um, not really that surprising, I think. And then, of course, this is not really a surprise at all. The cash is a pretty active group, so. Um, 33% of them doing at least 140 caches every year, which is really impressive if you get to know earth caching because earth caching involves a lot of, sometimes a lot of travel. Um, we heard over and over again that, boy, you know, there's some people that they find, uh, I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. You know, they find the earth caches that are in their area and then, you know, they do them all and and then you know you're you're faced with I need to travel to other places to do more earth caching, right? So then there's travel involved, which involves time and money, and so sometimes it's, it can be pretty difficult to get a lot of earth caches under your belt in a year. Um, so a lot of people that we talked to already were traveling for a lot of different reasons. You know, they just either like to travel and were able to. Um, they traveled for work, and they would do earth caching along the way if they could. So, um, so it's definitely something that might require some travel. So the other main part, besides finding out who we had earth caching, um, was which caches people really liked. And so let me share. Go back to sharing for a second. So we asked people, please work, there we go. We asked people what their favorite type of earth cache was. We asked them what they didn't like. Um, but this shows now that it's working right. Yay, so this is cache preferences. So why do people earth cache and what are the favorite things that they like about it? Um, over and over again, we heard that people liked rare and unusual features. So there was this aspect of, this is something I've never seen before. This is so wild, so different. You know, that's what I love and that's what keeps me coming back. You know, that opportunity to, to really see something I have never seen before. And we heard over and over again, you know, I would have never gone to this place and seen this thing if it weren't for the earth cache. So they really saw earth caching as an opportunity to get them sort of almost out of their comfort zone a little bit, off the beaten path, and to something that they would have never seen otherwise. So rare and unusual features, seeing something new were the two big things that people loved about earth caching. Um, they also spoke a little bit about, um, you know, sometimes it was convenience that they really appreciated. Um, they definitely appreciated the beautiful scenery. Um, some people looked at it as an opportunity, another reason to get out and do some hiking and walking. And then, um, but it couldn't be for some people not too physically demanding. So again, there's, and there's a range of earth cache experiences you can have. So I like know, how, whatever you're looking for. I like how low convenient location and not too physically demanding are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <Hello>. yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and there's there's definitely a physical component to even, I mean, for the sort of easy one we did, right? You still have to get there. You still have to get out and walk. So, um, you know, if that's an issue for you, then, you know, you probably haven't done a lot of earth caches, and, and maybe you can't do them at all. Um, but again, there is a variety of them, and there certainly are some where they're very accessible, um, even if you're, you know, in a wheelchair or you have trouble walking, I mean, there's, it's, it's like, you know, the parks and things that become very accessible. So you, you just have to kind of pick and choose and think about that. And so, yeah, in a convenient location is <laughs> not really, 
not really an issue. We go more for the, the wild, you know, beautiful landforms that we want to see. Um, let's see. So then we asked about... Can I ask a question? Um, oh, sure. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. What kind of unusual features are there that people can see? Um, a lot of them involved, um, you have to think of certainly things like uh, volcanoes. <laughs> um, usually, I mean, it could be any, so any landform, of course, can be made into an earth cache. And so what people would say is it was anything that was different from where they lived. So it depends on where you live as to what is, you know, wild and new for you. Um, and certainly, though, some rose to the top more than others. So if it's something that's just rare, no matter, you know, where you live, so like a volcano, um, big rock formations, um, I don't know, what else, glaciers. Um, so things that you just don't see, you know, every day, definitely. Um, just wild, beautiful landforms. And sometimes... Um, for example, in this picture, it's just, and I don't even know what this picture is for, but, you know, sometimes there's a feature that just in itself is strange and unusual, like a rock sitting out, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And so, you know, how did that rock get there? You know, what were the earth processes that, you know, led to this? And what does it mean? So sometimes it's just that chance to learn something new that you wouldn't have known before. Um, and then the, this slide shows motives to continue. So um, again, learning about the earth is really big. So we also discovered that learning was really important to this group. They wanted to learn. They wanted to see the really cool things, but they also wanted to learn about why they were there, um, what it meant, um, and then, you know, just more about the earth. Um, but there were other motivations also. So sometimes it's, you know, um, traveling, being outdoors was kind of a nice one, um, and then and then learning. So um, again, here it's interesting, you know, not necessarily spending time with friends and family, um, and that's an interesting one. We had lots of earth cashers that, you know, for them this was something they did on their own, and it'd be interesting to kind of dive into that a little bit in which we didn't really have time to do. But, you know, is this something that people like to do more as a chance to really get away from everything so they want to go alone? Or is it just sort of logistically difficult to get the whole family or to get a big group together and go do this? Um, what's kind of going on there? But it did seem to be more of a, a solitary kind of um, activity in a way um, for whatever reason. Okay. So there's some, you know, what reminds me about um, citizen science motivations too with this is again we got with CosmoQuest and with Galaxy Zoo and a lot of thing, a lot of those kinds of projects. It's the that interest in discovery and interest in seeing, you know, something really awesome that they haven't seen before. Um, that's a big player in citizen science, and so it was also it's also something we found with EarthCache. So there was some overlap there. Let's see. And so the other thing um, is that we're thinking about is that this is an activity that can be a nice educational activity for inside the classroom. So even though it's technically informal. Using this. Oh, sorry, say that again. I was wondering if you ran into any teachers using this. We did um, run into at least somebody who was uh, working at a nature center and did... Um, more like camps, so it was still informal science, but she used earth caches in that capacity. So she took her groups out and did earth caching, and it was through this nature center that she worked at. Um, we didn't really talk to anybody who was a formal educator and used this, but we know that there are some teachers out there that do use it, and in fact, if you go to the earthcache.org site and you go to the getting started link in the top menu. Um, there's a place called earthcaching. earthcache.org in the showcase. Oh, sorry, say that again. I did put earthcache.org in the showcase for those of you. Okay. 
And so there is a guide for teachers. So you can download this. I happen to have it. Um, but there is a whole nice little booklet. You can download it as a PDF. It's not really too huge, so it should be doable. And that's their educator's guide. And this is something I have to say that this whole research project um, has been a partnership with the Geological Society of America, and in particular, Gary Lewis, who heads up the education stuff within the GSA, um, has been really, really helpful and a great partner as far as helping us here at SIUE access earth cachers. And so uh, we have to thank him. And he um, had a big part to play in writing this educator guide. So it's a very, very good tool if you are interested as a teacher in trying out some aspect of or an entire earth cache with your students. So it kind of introduces you to earth caching, um, lets you know some of the things you're going to need. Um, obviously, you do need GPSs to really do it you know, the way it was intended. Um, but if you don't have that, there's even there's ideas in this book about how to um, either, you know, borrow some, write grants for them, or even do an earth cache, you know, from your school or from campus, as they call it. So if you can't get out there, you still need internet, but you can, you know, have some aspect of the experience without really going out into the field, you know, if you're limited that way. And, you know, ideally you'd go out and experience, you know, the real thing. But if you can't, you can still get a lot of the, the fun and the benefits and the engagement by just having internet access and staying in the classroom if that's what you can do. So there's a lot of great ideas for how to get earth caching into the classroom, into the formal education world with that. So what was it like hanging out at the Earth Cacher Conference? I mean, did you get to talk to people about their experience? Um, it was, uh, Do you have any interesting stories from that? Um, these are uh, a bunch of really gung-ho people. <laughs> it was so much fun to be with them. And they're all, you know, they're all these real energetic, outdoorsy types. And they're, they're just out there, you know, exploring um, their surroundings. Um, really, you just get the sense of people that are kind of living life to the fullest, and they're big adventurers, and they're so, you know, like, I mean, I keep saying, I keep thinking of amateur astronomers, because that's who I'm familiar with, but um, if you've ever been to a star party and you, you see the amateur astronomers, you know, they're so gung-ho because they, they're doing what they love and they want to share. And so it was the same thing with the Earth Cashers. You know, you just got the sense of that this was the greatest thing ever. They were doing what they love, and they want to share. And so they were wonderful. Um, we talked to 12, actually 13 of them, because one was a husband-wife team. And uh, the, first, the first year we went, and they were just so friendly. Um, you could tell they really loved this. They thought it was such a valuable activity and interested in the research side of things, too. And then when we went back, so this past time, we went back and we presented our initial results, um, just some of the stuff we've been talking about today. And they were, again, very interested, very appreciative of the fact that somebody's, you know, looking into their experiences and this activity. Um, and, you know, the fun thing about these events is that they always are located at a really cool geological place. So this last one being in Vancouver, of course, there was the, the rainforests that are there, the temperate rainforests, lots of cool places to go and see. Um, so the surroundings are really amazing. Um, and we did a little follow-up interview with some of the earth cachers when we were here last time, too. And again, that was just sort of to check our, kind of to check our results and make sure we were on the right track with what we were thinking. And again, they were just very accommodating and very willing to, to sit and chat with us. And uh, so it was, it was a really great time. Did you get a sense of what gets people started with earth caching? Like where they first heard of it? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm not sure. Um, and it was partially the weird way we asked our question. <laughs> in our survey, in our interviewing, you know, we asked, you know, how did you get into earth caching? And most of the time the answer was through geocaching. And we didn't really follow up with, well, so how did you get into geocaching? 
um, because we were just cash focused, I guess, at that point. Um, a lot of it, though, you know, we heard some stories of certainly, you know, parents, family that were interested. Um, there's a lot of uh, geoscientists that are, of course, involved because of the earth science, you know, content that's in there. Um, but I don't have I don't have a good sense of yeah how did you first you know stumble onto if that's how it happened you know geocaching or earth caching um, a lot of it you know sometimes it's just uh, word of mouth and somebody you know they know is doing it you know there were a few few times we would hear that but I don't have a, a good sense of you know the bulk of the people got into it this way so. Except, looking at the website, they have um, an Earth Cache virtual 5K they're doing, which I guess you, you rack up five kilometers um, with your Earth Caches. Uh, and they geofenture to Hawaii uh, because, of yeah. course, there are volcanoes. Um, unfortunately, active volcanoes that are destroying people's houses, but there's a lot. Of uh, interesting sites that are, are preserved and, and not uh, destroying people's houses as well as they I have yes they have lots there's lots of great trips um, there's these gatherings you know this was a huge gathering of earth cashers but of course they have smaller more local gatherings um, all over so again it's something you just need to sort of go to the website kind of look around and see you know what what's going on um, but yeah lots of social events involved. Uh, and I can let me show you one more slide before we end up here. Um, this is the slide about what people think they've learned of caching. Because it is basically an educational activity. Is there? Okay. Okay, so lots of things about the Earth, obviously. Um, the largest number of people said. Um, that it was the processes, earth processes that they learned about, which I'm kind of interested in because I think that's something you don't, you're not always aware of. You're not always, you know, you see these, you know, amazing earth features, but um, a lot of times you don't get a sense that the earth is very active and that there's lots of things going on all the time. And then sometimes it's really obvious what's going on, you know, process-wise, if there's um, a flood or a storm or a volcano that's active. Um, or, you know, wind. I mean, there's times when it's very obvious, but then there's a lot of times when there's these processes that are a little more subtle or occurring over a very long period of time, and you're unaware of those unless you have an activity like this that really points it out. So Earth processes was the uh, most often cited thing that people were learning, and people could choose more than one for this answer, so there's a lot of answers. Um, the other things were how the Earth was formed and how the Earth has changed over time, um, the Earth's composition. Um, a few people said that, you know, writing and communication skills and then navigation skills um, come into play here too, which is not really surprising, I guess. Um, and we have GPS skills a little bit too. So, so there's a little bit of that. Basically, it's a lot of good geoscience content though that people at least think that they're learning. So this was all a perception-based... Um, right. So we didn't go out and give anybody like a pre- or post-test for, you know, <laughs> uh, volcanoes or glaciers or anything like that. So, um, you know, that's something that's a little harder to do and, and could be a part of, of later studies. But, but this was all sort of a first um, step to exploring what people uh, think they're learning. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. So, um, just an amazing, really fascinating, fascinating activity. And it's very accessible. Like I could say if you, um, you know, go to the website. There's all kinds of earth caches, and from you know, really easy ones to more difficult and challenging ones. And so you should go and just see what's around. You know, there's probably many that you didn't even realize were in your area and you will learn a lot about the area you live in. Um, <laughs> things you would have never known, places you would have never gone to in your own area and it's kind of funny. You end up kind of feeling like a tourist or a, you know, a visitor in your own local area. So start out local with earth caching and, and learn. Learn what's all around you. 
cool. And yeah, like I said, when in 2004, when I first heard about geocaching, it was not um, within my means because even though I was traveling a lot as a student, I didn't, I couldn't afford a GPS, and I was traveling, you know, with a, an intern group. Um, but now the smartphones have made that GPS ubiquitous, and so it's at least lowered the bar technologically for people getting into these kinds of activities. Yeah, it really has. So if you can at least get to the internet somehow, um, you know, you can still have that experience. And it's not so much about the navigating, you know, with the Earth Cache as it is for just getting out there and experience, experiencing something outdoors and learning about the Earth. So, um, you know, there's other ways you can get at it. I know, I don't even know if anybody was using a GPS when we went out to our, our watershed Earth Cache because it was a local place. I mean, we knew where. The only one who turned her GPS on to, like, look for the geocache that was at the same spot. Right, right. And so sometimes it kind of depends on the earth cache, too. You know, there, there might be a very particular spot that they want you to go in. But a lot of times there's enough description um, on the site, the website, that you need to look at, you know, so that you kind of get a feel for what you're supposed to see and where you're supposed to go without having, you know, a particular navigation issue. Oh, yeah. So you can still, you know, you can still get what you need to get. <laughs> So, yeah, so I actually, on my to-do list is to get out there and do some more earth caches that are right around, right around close to home. But the cool thing is, if, you know, if you do get to travel and you're on vacation, you know, it can add another element to your vacation. So it can be another reason to get out there. And, you know, when you're going somewhere and you want to know, you know, what's cool to do? What should I see? What are the sites to look at? You know, you can check the earthcaching.org site and see what some of these activities are that people have put out there and that can be the basis for your itinerary for a certain spot you know let that let that be your guide instead of a basic tourist guide and you will definitely get off the beaten path into places where a lot of people would never end up going and you will learn something do you, do you get little badges for that little like tokens or status for doing a certain number Yes, so yeah, the other thing um, I didn't really talk about is it can be kind of competitive, um, but again, these are really gung-ho people, and so yes, there are different levels that you can get to for completing a certain amount of caches, and they have, I'm going to forget the levels now, um, so you get like quartz, mica, I do have them here, <laughs> emerald, diamond level for the and I believe diamond is that you've done more than a thousand, logged more than a thousand. So that's pretty huge. Um, but I do need to double check on that because I can't remember all the specifics. But yeah, there's different levels you can get to. And oh, for, like I know that's just for doing doing them. Um, and but you can also become a developer of an Earth Cache. So if you if there's a site around or you just know of somewhere where it's really significant or really beautiful and you know you don't think there's a cache there already um, there's guidelines for developing earth caches again on the website and you can develop your own earth cache and and make and lead people to that place and so then there's of course different levels different award levels for people that have developed earth caches and those are bronze silver gold and platinum so you can get those different statuses for being more and more involved in earth caching. So yeah, there's a lot of that. And there's a lot of, um, I mentioned the coins, that people will make their own coins. And sometimes, for example, at these big events, you know, there's an official coin that they made for the event. So people collect them, they trade them. Um, it's really cool. It's a lot of cool stuff. So they have a lot of fun that way. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can really get into the spirit of it and into the, you know, even the competition of it if you want to. Uh, Nancy points out that a friend of hers and a friend of ours and her daughter did a geocaching tour of Ireland last summer. So that's another Ireland link. <laughs> so it can be the basis of a whole trip, and and it real and it is a lot of the the people we talk to who are really into it. You know, this is how they, you know, they look you know, pick an area they want to go and they look for all the, the earth caches that are there and that's their goal is they want to get out there and they want to get all the, log all the earth caches that are in a certain area. Very cool. Very cool. And then they get the, they get the bragging rights for that. 
There's another hobby I wish I had time to do. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. It's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, it was it was nine a.m. on a Friday when we went to the watershed, so I wasn't completely there. You're not awake. <laughs> it was really pretty. Yeah, well, you know, you can do nighttime caching as long as you're allowed on the site. <laughs> yes. So yes. you know, yeah, if the site's officially closed, don't go there and earn cash. Then you've got to wait. But depends on where the cache is. Sometimes, a lot of times, they're within national parks and and different places that have restrictions as to when you can get there, you know, they, they close at dusk or whatever. So, um, and that's usually something that you can find on the website um, when you go to, you know, for the particular earth cache and it will give you that information if there's any restrictions or any particular equipment you need to bring with you, things like that. Um, so, um, you need to check that before you go. <laughs> So hopefully we are going to be able to expand our study um, in the future and you know there's different things we haven't decided yet but there's a lot of questions that we still have. We still want to know about youth and how they're involved. Um, you know can we broaden participation to this activity? Can we get more um, minority groups involved? Um, are there barriers out there that are keeping people from being involved or is it just an awareness thing? Um, and then, you know, the whole intersection with formal education, we want to talk to hopefully some teachers, um, see who's already using earth caching in the classroom, uh, and then get the word out and help um, more teachers um, do that. So um, lots of things still to look at in the future. So hopefully we will have a grant of some sort that can <laughs> let us know. Yeah, so that's the plans for the future. That's that's where it'll go. But it's been an awesome project so far and Earth Cashers are awesome and if you haven't tried it, you should definitely try it. Give it a go, unless it's below freezing, unless that's your thing. <laughs> well, you know, hey, <laughs> don't let the weather stop you. Yes. You no, the weather two days, so that might be a good thing, but if not, wait for spring. <laughs> I know, you always have to be safe too. It's cold out, just prepare, bundle up. Are there any dog-friendly ones? Can I take my Can I take Basie out on a walk? <laughs> oh, again, that depends on the site, but so you just have to check. But yeah, most of them probably would be okay with that. But if it's depends on on where you're going, so you need to check that on the site before you go. Okay, cool. Yes, get your dog earth caching. <laughs> the exercise. Our our block's getting boring. Oh, see, then you can write. You can go walking with a purpose. Yeah. Right. You know, learn more about the Earth. Okay. Yeah. Go somewhere you haven't gone before. So uh, Elad says, "Ooh, there's a site not far from my home. So <laughs> go do it. <laughs> Tell us how it was." <laughs> so if you go out and you do an Earth cache, let us know what you did. I would I would love to know if, you know what your experience is. So you can email us. Educate. Or ping us on the plus, yeah. <laughs> that's over there. Yeah, that's the thing. People know where to find us, so. <laughs> well, thank Good and bad. You, Georgia, for coming sure. to talk about this topic, and especially last minute, because I asked you yesterday. <laughs> no, I think, no problem. It was great. It's great. Yeah, awesome, awesome. yeah. Thank you guys for watching, for your comments and questions. Um, let's see. Our, our usual schedule has us doing the weekly space hangout on Friday. At noon Pacific, um, I will not. I know I will not be there this week because I'll be on the road to a um, a con. In fact, I'm wearing the T-shirt for it. I should show you guys because it's dinosaurs in space. Um, nice. Actually, it's it's actually Skepticon, so it's a, a skepticism atheism conference in Missouri, <laughs> driving distance. But I'm going to talk about citizen science, of course, because there's a, a lot of overlap with people who are interested in science in that community. Yeah. Um, so that so anyway so if you're in Missouri this weekend come skip the con. Uh, otherwise go to the weekly space hangout on Friday uh, with Fraser Kane and all of the space journalists that he's rounded up this week. Um, and then astronomy cast is on Monday. I don't know if they have a topic picked out yet, but I'll put it in the newsletter tonight uh, if I can hang out that posted. Mm -hmm. And then next week I'm not entirely sure what next week topics it's going to be. I know for those of us in the U.S. it's Thanksgiving Eve. I'm not going anywhere, so <laughs> I'm not going to. Do an episode, um, either if we can uh, get a uh, reschedule a guest or if we can come up with another topic. And I think you were available as well. So 
Okay. We'll have a U.S. Thanksgiving Eve broadcast next week. Um, topic TBA. <laughs> <laughs> And if you have any, um, as usual, if you have any topics or guests you want to see on the show, or if you want to be on the show and tell us a little bit about your uh, science education experiences, um, you can email us at educate at cosmogos.org. You can ping George or I on, uh, we're both on Twitter. You're actually, your Twitter and your handle is actually easy. It's Georgia Bracey, right? <laughs> and Montez There's nothing still. too creative there. It's just, it's just what it is. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Facebook, yeah. on Facebook and let us know. Um, we are mostly booked through this semester, but we're hoping to continue uh, somehow through next semester as well. But that's currently TBA um, for various reasons. Um, but we, I, I think I, I would like to, to keep the show going um, and get some more guests on. So let us know if you're interested. Um, we, I do have a Christmas Eve show scheduled. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> a very noisy Christmas. It'll be a very noisy Christmas Eve special because my my partner works for retail, so he'll be at work, and we're not. I'm not traveling till after Christmas, so I'll find something. We can gather around the internet and amuse ourselves. Yeah, I know. <laughs> a lot of cool topics coming up, including a worldwide telescope. Um, and I can't remember Worldwide Telescope and, and something else. But anyway, check the schedule. Uh, it's on CosmoQuest.org. Um, but that's pretty much it for now. So thank you, guys. Hey, thanks, everybody, As for always. watching. Yes, and we'll see you next week. Yes, 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 yes. All right, we'll be at last. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>